Hello, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Sanyal Schulten, the Deputy Head of HCV Access here at FIND, the Foundation for Innovative New Diagnostics. And we are going to be doing a webinar today that's done in partnership with World Hepatitis Alliance. Today, we'll be talking about strategies to increase access and linkage to care for hepatitis C. This webinar is part of a series of webinars that we are doing with the World Hepatitis Alliance. The first one we did was on hepatitis C diagnostic basics. And so we are continuing moving from the basics of hepatitis C diagnostics, such as basic diagnostic technology, basic tests that are available, and the World Health Organization's um, hepatitis C testing algorithm. We're moving from those topics done in the first webinar to now talking about strategies to actually use the hepatitis C tests that we have to increase access and linkage to care for hepatitis C. If you didn't have a chance to see our first webinar and would like to, uh, please do so. We'll include information uh, down in the link below. Thank you. So a little bit of background about FIND. Find is a global nonprofit which is driving diagnostic innovation to combat major diseases. We have offices in Vietnam, India, Kenya, South Africa, and Geneva. And we focus on several disease areas, antimicrobial resistance, tuberculosis, hepatitis and HIV, pandemic preparedness, malaria and fever, and tuberculosis. So, when we talk about available information on strategies to increase access and linkage to care, let's first think about what's out there that we can find to reference. The first thing in the global health community that we like to do is make evidence-informed decisions. So that means taking lessons learned and evidence from previous programs, projects, and studies, evaluating them, understand what worked, what could have been improved, and using those lessons to take them forward to try and deliver the best possible service delivery to patients, recipients of care. So there are a few available options uh, out there for you to reference for strategies. The first one I'll speak about is the World Health Organization, or WHO's, Guidelines on Hepatitis B and C Testing. Now, this guideline is kind of a long document, but chapter 17 focuses on service delivery approaches for viral hepatitis testing, examples from the field. So that could be useful for you. They've compiled a lot of work that's been done from um, actors such as Doctors Without Borders, also called MSF, um, as well as some community or local organizations that have been providing hepatitis C testing and linkage to care. Then another source of information is systematic reviews. So what systematic reviews are is a group, a research group, academic group, or other, um, goes through all of the available published literature on a specific topic. They take all of the studies or write up some projects they can find and review them all together. They to try to take all of the information from different, different, different studies and evaluate them all in one place. Systematic reviews can be helpful because they pull together a lot of different studies and they can help to understand uh, across different contexts what type of service delivery methods uh, achieve high impact results or what ones may not work so well. So there are unfortunately not that many systematic reviews done for the recent DAA era of hepatitis C. That means the recent era of the highly effective treatments, but there are a few. There's one which is uh, entitled Interventions to Enhance Testing, Linkage to Care, and Treatment Uptake for Hepatitis C Virus Infection Among People Who Inject Drugs. And that has been published in the International Journal of Drug Policy. So unfortunately, this one um, is uh, only accessible if you have access to that journal, or maybe if you're in a university setting and your university library has access. And then the second one that's available is a systematic review and meta-analysis of community and primary health care-based hepatitis C testing and treatment services that employ direct acting antiviral drug treatments. And this one is open access, um, and that was published fairly recently in October 2019. 
The only caveat about these two systematic reviews is that they only include studies from um, high income countries or the global north. So that means they only include studies from places like the United States of America, the continent of Europe, Australia, and Canada. Um, so that may not be as representative of the whole global picture. Um, one of the reasons for this may be that there just wasn't that many studies or projects published about um, projects or programs in the global south or low income country, low middle income countries. There's another forthcoming systematic review that's coming out, Service Delivery for Hepatitis C Care, a systematic review and meta-analysis. And now this one is interesting because it includes 85 studies, 19 of which are from low middle income countries. Now, that one's not available in publication yet, but you can find the poster that was presented at the International Liver Conference in 2019. And then what we will talk about today is the emerging evidence from the Head Start program. Head Start is a project that's taking place in four countries, and the objective of the projects and studies within the Head Start portfolio is to understand the impact, effectiveness, and cost effectiveness of various hepatitis C diagnostic approaches in different settings. And in each country, I should note, we're working in different populations with different service delivery models. So in the case of Georgia, we are working in harm reduction sites that are targeted towards people who inject drugs. In India, in Delhi, we are working among the general population, introducing rapid diagnostic tests at the low level of the healthcare system. In Punjab in India, we are working with people who are living with HIV. So we are integrating hepatitis C testing and treatment linkages services into the ART clinics. Those are the clinics that people living with HIV attend for their antiretroviral medicine. And in Manipur in India, we are working with a series of NGOs, non-governmental organizations, uh, looking to bring the hepatitis C screening and confirmation testing down to a uh, primary health care level in the community. And in Malaysia, we are uh, working on introducing rapid diagnostic tests into the primary health care center with a hub and spoke model. And this population we're focusing on is a general population, um, but the general population that may have um, encountered some risk factors for hepatitis C. And in Myanmar, we are working with uh, Burnett Institute to look at a one-stop shop approach to hepatitis C. So that's bringing the hepatitis C treatment, testing and treatment to a drug treatment center and a community-based clinic. And then we're also working with CHAI, Clinton Health Access Initiative, and the Myanmar National Health Lab to understand how it goes when you integrate hepatitis C testing onto an existing machine that's being used for HIV testing. So now these studies and projects are still ongoing, and so we don't have the final data yet. But we do have some pretty interesting preliminary data. And given what I shared earlier that Unfortunately, there's not a lot of published literature about um, service delivery approaches to hepatitis C um, in the global south and low and middle income countries. We thought it could be helpful to share some of the emerging lessons from Head Start. Once we have finalized our studies and projects and have completed all of the data cleaning and analyses, then we will produce the final results where we can talk really about the full care cascade. That is the steps that people go from screening, confirmation, treatment initiation, treatment completion, and test of cure. But we don't have that full cascade uh, finalized yet as the studies are still ongoing, but we can talk about the beginning part of the cascade. So the emerging lessons in relation to screening for hepatitis C, linking to confirmatory treatment, so confirmatory testing and linking to treatment. So when we think about the emerging lessons, I find it helpful to think about them in three kind of distinct themes. And those are decentralization, simplification, and integration. So let's talk about the first one, decentralization. What does that mean in this context? 
Well, normally when we speak about the health system, we, can, we generally speak about it in a pyramidal structure in three levels, starting from the close to the patient, simple healthcare service delivery, moving upwards to the higher level centers. So generally we say there is level one, which is primary healthcare. Now these can be like your primary care clinics, they um, are maybe staffed by a community health worker or a nurse. They may or may not be staffed by a doctor. And then you have your level two healthcare, secondary healthcare. Now, these could be something like district hospitals. Um, here, normally, you do find doctors, uh, more com complex laboratory abilities as well. And then you have level three, your tertiary care. So these are usually the larger hospitals, the specialist hospitals, and these are generally the places where you'll, you will find hepatologists in the case of um, hepatitis or cardiologists or those other specialized service delivery. So when we talk about decentralization, what we are talking about is bringing the service down from the higher level to the lower level healthcare. So this can be bringing the service down from tertiary care to secondary, from tertiary care to primary, from secondary to primary. It's all about trying to figure out how you can shift the care from a higher level specialized to a level closer to the patient and shift it in a way where the quality of care is still delivered. So why is there this kind of move towards decentralization? It's happening not just in hepatitis, but also in many other disease areas. Well, part of it is thinking about the patient journey. So when you think about the patient perspective of seeking health care, it's easier for the patient to seek health care if they can go to a service that's closer to them physically. Um, and in the case of hepatitis, as in hepatitis C, we as the service providers, we kind of are asking the patients, the recipients of care, of, to do us a favor, right? Because we want to try and identify these people before they become symptomatic with the disease so we can get them onto treatment so then they have a chance for better health outcomes. So in that case, if, if I'm a patient and I'm not really feeling symptomatic, um, it may be more difficult for me to find the time in my schedule to take time off work, find somebody to look after the kids, go from my town maybe to the next town over or even farther just for a screening test or a confirmatory test. So you want to try and bring the services as close to the patient as possible to encourage them to take up these services. Now, we can look at decentralization in the Head Start through two different studies. One is in Malaysia, where we brought screening from the centralized level down to the primary healthcare level by the introduction of rapid diagnostic tests for hepatitis C. And the second is Georgia, where we brought the confirmatory testing from a centralized level down to a primary healthcare level in the form of harm reduction sites. And something that was a really interesting effect of decentralizing the diagnostics, it actually catalyzed the national programs in both of those countries to then decentralize the treatment to those low levels as well. So specifically thinking about Malaysia, wherein we decentralize the screening test. So here I'm showing a map of Peninsula Malaysia and where we have the study site. So we introduced in partnership with DNDI, uh, CRM, and the Malaysian MOH, we introduced rapid diagnostic test for hepatitis C into um, 25 primary healthcare clinics. Those primary healthcare clinics were then connected to a district hospital. And so what we did was we did a risk-based screening in those 25 primary healthcare clinics. And if a person was screened HCV positive on the RDT, then they physically had to go to the district hospital to get blood drawn for confirmation and further workup. But as I mentioned, um, in the case of Malaysia, introducing the RDT actually catalyzed the government to um, start providing treatment in the primary healthcare clinics. So even though the patient identified RDT positive, had to go to the district hospital, get their initial workup, once it was determined that if they were an uncomplicated case, they could then receive the treatment back at their primary healthcare clinic. You may notice from the map that some of the primary healthcare clinics, especially in Kedah and Kelantan, are kind of far away from district hospitals. 
So the ability to bring the treatment to the primary healthcare clinic um, could potentially make it a lot easier for the patient to continue their treatment. And one thing I want to note about Malaysia is it's a population of 32 million people and the HCV estimate, so the estimate of how many percent people have hepatitis C in Malaysia in the general population ranges from 0.3 to 2.5 percent. But because we were doing risk-based screening in the cohort that was involved in our study, we screened 15,000 323 people, and we found a 13% prevalence of hepatitis C. So that means 211 people we found with hepatitis C. Now, 13% is a lot higher than 0.3 to 2.5%. So we think one of the reasons may be we offer this risk-based approach. So uh, in the PowerPoint, you can see we list down all of the uh, risk factors. Now these are the risk factors for all participants. So not just the risk factors for those who screened RDT positive uh, or those who screened negative. You may see something interesting here, which is that the other undisclosed risk factor is quite high, with 41% reporting. Now people could choose multiple risk factors. Um, and this other undisclosed we left actually um, based on the consultation and advice of the Ministry of Health and the primary health care centers. They felt that it would, offering an open category would allow people to feel more comfortable coming forward. So as part of the study, we created a bunch of posters, educational posters that we put around the primary health care clinics that listed all of the potential risk factors. Blood transfusion before the uh, safe screening came into play nationally in Malaysia, piercings, um, past prison, tattoos, uh, injection drug use, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So those are all around the clinics. And this way the people could become exposed to them um, and say, mm, okay, maybe I have some of these risk factors. But maybe because of the cultural context, they would feel a little bit shy to tell the healthcare worker specifically which risk factor they have. So because of a combination potentially of the educational posters, um, and then they were able to come and say, okay, I think I have a, a risk factor, but I would prefer not to disclose it. And they were still offered the screening. So because we saw, we saw a 13% prevalence of hepatitis C, another interesting thing to note is the cost for patient identified. It's around $6.23. So that is um, just counting the cost of RDT. So basically how many people you'd have to screen to find one RDT positive. Um, and this is, it would be above, it would be around $30 plus for patient identified if it was a lower prevalence. So meaning if it was that 0.3 to 2.5%, it would cost more for patient identified. This is an important consideration because as we may know, there's not a lot of funding for hepatitis C. And so programs, projects, and governments have to make really careful considerations about how they can be the most effective with the budget that they have. So in thinking about uh, decentralization of the confirmatory tests as we see in Georgia, so Georgia is a bit of a different context than Malaysia, as opposed to 32 million people, they've got 3.7. But you may notice that the HCV seroprevalence, so that means the number of people who would screen RDT positive, in the general population is 7.7%, which is quite high. And it is even higher in the people who inject drugs, uh, 50 to 90, almost 92%. So Georgia embarked on a national elimination program in 2015, and they've made really good progress. But as they've been moving towards their elimination program, they noticed that they were having a difficulty between people who screen RDT positive for hepatitis C and those same people being linked to the confirmatory test. They noticed that this was particularly problematic among the people who inject drugs. In some cases, seeing up to 50% loss between uh, screening HCV RDT positive and getting that confirmatory test. So with that in mind, we designed the study with the input of the Georgian National Centers for Disease Control, uh, Ministry of Health, and Georgian Harm Reduction Network to try and understand what are some ways that could close that gap. 
So we have a three-arm study here. Um, it was an eight-harm reduction site. So in arm one, we introduced point-of-care confirmatory testing at the harm reduction site. So this means people come to the harm reduction site, if they screen positive, they would immediately be given a chance for a confirmatory test on site. In arm two, which took place in two harm reduction sites, if a person screened RDT positive, they were immediately given the chance to have blood draw for a confirmatory test. That blood would then be sent to a centralized lab to actually run the test. And then the results would come in sometime afterwards, not the same day like in arm one. And in arm three was the standard of care. So that was in two harm reduction sites. And what happened there was a person would come, get screened RDT positive, and then they would be counseled and referred to a separate treatment location that would be offsite. So the primary message I'd like to highlight here is of the 1,672 people enrolled in this study, 1,517 completed a confirmatory test. In ARM1, where they had the point of care testing on site, 100% received the confirmatory test. In ARM2, where they enrolled 485 people, 483 people received the confirmatory test. So that's 99.4%. And in arm three, the standard of care, where the patient was referred to a separate treatment clinic, 77.5% received a confirmatory test. So the key considerations for decentralization are, decentralizing screening and confirmatory services can increase access to testing, bringing it down to a level and thus allowing more people to potentially benefit from it. Screening approaches that are targeted cost less per patient than a screen all who, who attend for care approach. An on-site blood draw and on-site point of care testing for confirmatory tests results in a very high completion of confirmatory testing. So the second uh, theme to talk about is simplification. So when we think about simplification, we can think about it in a couple of ways. And the first way to think about why simplification could make sense is it's easier for the patient if we simplify the fewer visits and the reducing the number of tests, the less visits the patient has to make, the less tests that have to get done, and potentially the less they have to pay out of pocket if these tests are not covered by a state or national health insurance or universal health coverage. So we'll talk about the Head Start Delhi, where they can have one visit for both screening and blood draw for confirmation and liver staging. So then by visit two, they can be initiated on treatment. Simplification is also easier for the system. Fewer tests means a less monetary outlay from government budgets. So in the case where governments are covering you know, through state or national health insurance these tests, the least number of tests you have to do the less the government has to pay. So reducing tests to bring algorithms in line with the World Health Organization recommendations for hepatitis C testing is a great way to pursue simplification. And we also see that the quickest treatment initiation is seen when genotyping and ultrasound as standard for all patients is removed. So to talk a little bit about simplification and the Head Start Delhi study. This study we are doing in partnership with ILBS and the Directorate of Health Services, Department of Health and Family Welfare, the Government of Delhi. And what we've done is we've introduced rapid diagnostic tests into 15 polyclinics and five district hospitals. So on the map here, you can see the dots where the polyclinics are and the district hospital that they are associated with. Overall, Delhi has around 18 million people, and it's estimated that the hepatitis C prevalence in the general population is around 1%. So what we're looking at here is the number of visits per patients for uncomplicated patients. Um, and you see you start with visit one and the patient comes and gets um, uh, HCV RDT using capillary blood. So it's a point of blood there, goes into a rapid diagnostic test, 20 minutes later, the patient is informed if they are HCV RDT positive or negative and uh, duly counseled for both of those. If the patient is HCV RDT positive, then at that same visit, they are given a blood draw and that blood draw is for both the confirmatory test and the liver staging. 
In Delhi, the liver staging that's done is using ACRI. So that's a, a formula that combines two standardly available blood tests. This way, when the patient comes back to visit two, they have already completed if they are viremic and their baseline investigation. And if the patient is decided to be non-complicated, non-serotic, they are initiated on treatment on that same day. And then visit three, four, and five are follow-up and review. Visit six is a test for a cure. That's called sustained viral response and is usually done 12 to 24 weeks after treatment is complete. And then the visit seven is the SVR report. So the test of cure reports if the patient is cured or not. If the patient is cured, they are counseled on how to um, best practices to not become reinfected with hepatitis C. And if the patient is not cured, then they are referred to a higher level specialist who then can work out an appropriate treatment plan. So to look at the care cascade for Delhi, of the 22,756 people screened in the district hospitals, uh, 699 were RDT positive. So we see a prevalence of around 3.1% RDT positive. This means it costs $26.08 per patient identified. So you see that is a much higher cost than the $6 or so we saw in Malaysia with a 13% prevalence. Now, of the 699 who screened RDT positive, 93% of them received an RNA test. Of those, 80% had an HCV positive result, meaning they needed treatment. And of those that needed treatment, 88% started on treatment. So while there is some loss along the care cascade, the 7% between number RDT screened and HCV RNA test done, and then number of those who should have started on treatment, who did. We'll compare this to some other care cascades we see. So we can see, um, can kind of compare them and see which ones are stronger in which areas. So another way to talk about simplification is to reduce the number of visits that's, that's needed, um, but in a different context. And so here we can talk about the Head Start Manipur study. This study was conducted in partnership with YRG Care. And it was a demonstration study to show a simplified diagnostic algorithm, which starts with HCV RDT screening in opioid substitution centers and NGOs that provide care interventions to people who inject drugs. Now in uh, Manipur, um, the population is 2.7 million and the HCV prevalence among people who inject drugs is uh, almost 65%. So as we can see the study flow here, screening hepatitis C, HCV, RDTs were offered at a series of NGOs. And now if that person was found HCV, RDT positive, then they physically had to go from the NGO location to the clinic. Um, now the clinic was a community level clinic, so not a big fancy clinic somewhere, um, but the patient still had to travel physically from the NGO to the clinic. And what we see here is that of the 6,958 screened, 3,461 are IDT positive, that's almost around 50% RDT positive of the population. And now the number who screened RDT positive who had an RNA test done, that's 84%. So if we compare that to the 93% we saw in Delhi, where the patient was staying in the same hospital and did not have to move from one, build, from one, from one organization to another for the screening test and the confirmation, versus here in Manipur, where the patient is screened in an NGO and then physically has to move to another site for the RNA confirmation, we see 84% get the RNA test done. Of those who got the RNA test done, 86% needed treatment, and of those who needed treatment, 82% started on treatment. So I think it's interesting com to compare. If you have the RDT testing and the blood draw for confirmatory testing in one location, versus what happens when the RDT testing is in one place and the confirmatory testing is in another. Another interesting thing to note about this is the cost per patient identified in this situation is $1.72. 
Now this is much less than both of the other two examples because the prevalence was 49.7%. That means you have to screen less people to find a positive person, uh, HCV positive person. So some key considerations about simplification. Bringing HCV testing algorithms in line with the World Health Organization recommendations is a good place to start simplification. Reducing the number of visits a patient has to make to start treatment can decrease loss to follow up. And you need to find a balance between simplifying as much as prudent while still maintaining quality care. So the last part to talk about will be integration. When we talk about integration in the context of hepatitis C, generally it's spoken about in two kind of different ways. One is integration of services. This is integrating hepatitis C testing and treatment into other existing platforms. And the second is integration of diagnostic testing. And this is more looking at the kind of technical aspect of this machine can do a lot of different tests. It's right now it's being used for TB. What happens if we also use it for hepatitis C? So for the sake of this video, and also for the sake of time, today I'm going to focus on integration of services. We are doing work as well on integration of testing, and if you are interested in that or have questions, feel free to reach out to me and I'd be happy to, to connect on that. So to talk about integration of services. The first primary thing that we have seen is that the integration must be tailored to the patient population and the existing infrastructure. So diagnostic algorithms should be adjusted to serve patients who are likely, returned, likely to return for other services, or if they are not likely to return to other services. You have to understand what patient population you are trying to serve in your context. Um, and also has to be structured for the infrastructure. If it's um, health services and systems which have very low HR capacity, introducing a whole bunch more processes, paperwork, and tests may not be well received than a, in a healthcare uh, worker who's already overworked. So we'll talk about integration of services in context of our Head Start Punjab project. So in Head Start Punjab, we are in, we introduced hepatitis C testing and linkage to care in 13 antiretroviral uh, clinics. So these are clinics where people living with HIV attend for their medication for HIV. We simplified the existing diagnostic algorithm by introducing RDTs. And if a person, um, we did reflex testing. So uh, every person who attended to the ART clinic had a blood draw done. Um, first, an RDT was done on the sample, and then if that RDT was positive for hepatitis C, then the sample was sent to the hub testing. And what we ended up seeing is around a 20% prevalence of hepatitis C among people living with HIV. So because it was 20% prevalence, it cost around $4.29 for patient identified. Here we see the care cascade. So. We have over 25,000 people screened, a little over 5,000 people who were screened RDT positive, and 98% of those received an HCV RNA test. So now this, in many ways, when we're thinking about the other projects that had 93%, 84% linkage, this one is 98%. And this is um, because of the reflex sampling. Um, so it wasn't reliant on patients coming back or moving to any other areas to get the HCV RNA test done. And of those who had an HCV RNA test done, 81% needed treatment. So some key considerations around integration. The Head Start Punjab project resulted in screening of over 80% of all patients attending for ART care who were eligible for HCV screening. Cooperation between various departments and clear agreement on responsibilities is key to ensuring linkage of HCV positive people living with HIV to care. You know, this is because maybe the people living with HIV are considered under the HIV program, and maybe normally hepatitis care is considered under the hepatitis program. 
And so you'll need to ensure that the two programs and departments are speaking to each other to ensure that patients are not being lost in the transfer from the HIV uh, program to then getting the treatment for hepatitis C. We also saw this in Malaysia, where they did a really great job of discussing and building bridges between the primary health care department, which oversaw all the primary health care clinics, and the um, uh, higher level hospital department, which oversaw the hospital. They had to bring bridges and make connections to ensure that patients could easily go in between the two levels. So the coordination between different departments is very important. And then considerations of additional workload. It's important when integrating a new service into existing one. Think about it if you were a health worker. How would you feel if you were asked to be doing more work for the same pay? So all of these considerations are, we think, important to be thinking about when thinking about integrating hepatitis C services. The easier it is for a patient, the stronger, more effective and cost efficient the care cascade will be. That's the real bottom line that we're, we're seeing that's emerging from our work and from the work that others have done in this area. So in terms of decentralization, decentralization of diagnostics to primary and healthcare level can be done through introducing rapid diagnostic tests, point of care testing, or on-site blood draw with a sample sent away for confirmation. Simplification is key to keeping patients engaged in the care pathway. It is possible to complete all needed blood draws on the first visit after RDT positive results. An integration of hepatitis C diagnostics into existing services results in high case finding, and it can be cost effective, and it requires continuous coordination between departments and branches of the health system. So I'd like to say thank you very much for joining us today. And we've really enjoyed making these first two videos, and we welcome any feedback that you have. The next video that we have planned is a hepatitis B diagnostics basics video. So we'll be working on that and hope to have that out in the, in the next coming months. And we'd also love to hear from you. What other aspects around diagnostics for hepatitis are you interested in hearing about? Um, the pi upcoming pipeline, new technologies, market aspects. Um, if you're interested in any of those, please let us know and we'll work with the World Hepatitis Alliance and try and figure out how we can make more, more webinars and get more useful information out to you guys. Thank you.